Well, thank you. It's, it's really a, a pleasure to be here. Um, it, it, it's kind of convenient to be the final person speaking in, in this series of people because really a lot of what I'm going to talk to has their strong connectivity here. Um, very, very robust connections to what you've heard from the other presenters and I will try and, and point out the ties to that. Um, so, so law is a very applied discipline, but when we're thinking about how does law adapt and how I, might we change law to help, social, help us navigate changes in social ecological systems, it has to be grounded in both theory and experience. I use the term experience, not empirical work, because we don't really do empirical work in, in legal scholarship. Um, and usually it's grounded, the theories it's grounded in are um, political theory and in economic theory. But in my case, and, and a great deal because my background was in, was in science, I've tried to do my work grounding it in, in scientific theories. And so trying, trying to have a better integration between what we're recommending in terms of legal models and what we understand about change in our social ecological systems. So that is where we're going to go today. And what I'm going to start with is, is just describing um, what happened the first time that I walked into a room of interdisciplinary people and we were all going to be talking about um, how we navigate climate change. How do we do adaption to climate change? I'm the only law scholar in the room. And one of my colleagues turns to me and says, well, of course, we have to start from the point that the only room in which we have to adapt, the boundaries on that, are set by law and used this. Law is a box. Well, well, this was really news to me because actually one of the reasons I had switched from geology to, to law was to learn an area and have a tool to try and affect change um, and also to study how, how we might change law. And so what I'm going to do today is, is first begin, since that's a common perception of law, with debunking that myth. So talking about how um, using examples, prominent examples from US history, how law and society have interacted in the past to affect change. Um, and then I'll move into it in, in the area of natural systems, environmental systems. Um, and then what I'm going to do from that is talk about a, a process we're trying to develop that really ties to where our conversation ended before the break. And that is how do we sort of come up with a way, and I would have to say it's not a theory or something, a new law a, that we can hand to Congress and say if you pass this, all things will be cured. It's the statement that there are no panaceas is absolutely accurate. And so what we've come up with is a method of inquiry that is, is place-based. So I'm going to lead you through sort of how we've arrived at that. It's a work in progress. So um, there won't be absolute answers. So, so let's begin with sort of the complex interplay between law and social change. Going back a ways, July 4, 1776, when the colonies declared the reasons that impelled them to separation from England, they said, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, that among those are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that to secure these rights, governance are in Governments are instituted among men, deriving their powers from the consent of the governed. Well, England would not have recognized this as a legal document at that point, but it certainly has become the founding legal document for the United States. But consider the complex interaction between society and law that has actually gone into making that statement of equality a reality. In 1863, President Abraham Lincoln issued the Emancipation Proclamation, and he said, and, and it was in the third year, it was during the Civil War, in the third year of the Civil War, 
All persons held as slaves within the rebellious states are and henceforth shall be free. Following that, the 13th Amendment was added to the Constitution, constitutionalizing the abolishment of slavery. Following that were the 14th and 15th Amendments, making it clear that that also applied in states, citizenship applied, and the right to vote applied. True social acceptance of equality still had a ways to go. In, oops, in achieving that, social movement used one of one other area of law. The First Amendment had been added to the Constitution in 1791, stating that Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech. So exercising that right, the Civil Rights Movement began to draw to the attention of the nation the problem of discrimination. And in 1954, Chief Justice Earl Warren, speaking for the U.S. Supreme Court in Brown versus the Board of Education, said segregation of white and colored children in public schools has a detrimental effect upon colored children. The impact is greater when it has the sanction of the law. For the policy of separating the races is usually interpreted as denoting the inferiority of the Negro group. We conclude that in the field of public education, the doctrine of separate but equal has no place. Separate educational facilities are inherently unequal. Well, it would still take your years for that legal pronouncement to become a social norm throughout the country. A leader in this movement, Martin Luther King Jr. in 1963 delivered his very famous speech from the steps of the Lincoln Memorial. He delivered it to the people who had just participated in the March on Washington. And he said, as we've all come to learn, now is the time to rise from the dark and desolate valley of segregation to the sunlit path of racial justice. I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will be judged by the color of their skin, not by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. The 1965 Voting Rights Act assured that our current president, Barack Obama, could actually vote in his own election. But it's his actual election that shows how pervasive the acceptance of equality has become. Okay, since it's late in the day and I want to get you moving, could I ask all of the women in the room to please stand? Sorry, sorry men for leaving you out in this. Okay, beginning is another social movement. In 1897, Susan B. Anthony said, there will never be complete equality until women themselves help to make the laws and elect the lawmakers. Jeanette Rankin was the first woman elected to Congress. She was elected to the House in 1916 from the state of Montana. At that time, she could not have voted for herself in most of the South, the Midwest, and the Eastern states. It wasn't until 1920, oops, 1920, that the, the 19th Amendment was added, giving women the right to vote in every state. The first woman was elected to the, House, to the Senate in 1932. Today we have 20 women in the Senate, 84 in the House. Sounds like a lot compared to one Jeanette Rankin, but that is 20 and 19% respectively. Title IX was passed in 1972, and it stated, no person in the United States shall, on the basis of sex, be excluded from participation in, be denied the benefits of, or be subjected to discrimination under any education program or activity receiving federal financial assistance. Those of us standing would not be here or would have had a harder path to go if it were not for this interaction of social movement and the law. Okay, you can be seated. Thank you for, for being my guinea pigs. Okay, 
What about law and, and social ecological systems? Well, parallel to the civil rights movement, we had the environmental movement. And, and it's hard to believe when you listen to the rhetoric of Congress today that this was a pervasive movement. I was in high school at the time. I lived in a very conservative rural community. Everyone rode their bike, rode their horses, rode, um, one, one guy had a bathtub with wheels on it. I mean, we, we got to school in any way we could without um, a car or a motorized vehicle of some sort. In its wake, a whole series of environmental law passed environmental laws passed that really revolutionized sort of the, the mediation between so society and its interaction with nature. In, and, and, and think about the words in these laws in the context of what we might expect from Congress today. In 1964, the Wilderness Act passed to secure to secure for American people of present and future generations the benefits of an enduring resource of wilderness. The Clean Water Act in 1972 passed to restore and maintain the chemical, physical, and biological integrity of the nation's waters. The Endangered Species Act passed in 1973 to provide a means whereby the ecosystems upon which endangered species and threatened species depend may be conserved. I think the, the, the law, the language that, that most represents sort of the difference between today and then is the language um, in the preamble to the 1970 uh, National Environmental Policy Act. The Congress recognizing the profound impact of man's activity on the interrelations of all components of natural the natural environment, and they go on to list those impacts. Population, urbanization, industrial expansion, resource exploitation, technology. And recognizing further the critical importance of restoring and maintaining environmental quality to the overall welfare and development of man declares it is the continuing policy of the federal government to create and maintain conditions under which man and nature can exist in productive harmony. Revolutionary ideas at the time. Well, so the idea that, that my colleague expressed when I walked into the room of law as a box was, was not consistent with this theory, but I also realized that there was some truth to it. Um, particularly in reference to the current implementation of the environmental laws that were enacted in the 60s and 70s. Um, we have become very rigid in our approach, as has been noted earlier here. Um, being a good academic, I developed two hypotheses. One being that those of us in the legal academy have simply remained in our silos too long, and we haven't communicated the power of law as a tool for change. Um, and the second one being environmental law is stuck. We, those of us who, who and, and I come from the, the baby boom generation, we, we've relied on the ideals of the environmental movement for too long. We failed to put forward a new model or a new approach um, that's consistent with, with our modern understanding of social ecological systems as being highly dynamic, nonlinear systems. And that if we are going to navigate these changes, we need to do so and we need to do so quickly. Um, well, I had two hypotheses, but, but being a lawyer, I, I wasn't hindered by the need for, for proof on either of them. I simply acted. And, and so um, maybe a more favorable way to my, to my discipline to put that is, I think the, the low-hanging fruit in legal scholarship is, is to take what the scientists and the social scientists are saying and the theories that they're developing, and, and rather than argue with that, simply say, OK, if that is true, this is what we need to do in the legal system to help us adapt and navigate change as we're going forward. So through building a, the interdisciplinary program that I'm in, in, um, in it, at the University of Idaho, 
um, I, I started to have a lot of colleagues who were ecologists and, and they exposed me to the writings that Steve talked about this morning um, on um, ecological resilience and, and I became familiar with the work of, of Holling, of Gunderson, of, of Walker and of Folke and others. Um, and it really, it really struck a chord with me. Um, and so I will go, and this is the connection to Steve's talk, to the, the bowl, the, the concept of resilience. Um, the fact, the idea that change in systems is nonlinear was very consistent with what I had learned as a geochemist. And so this was, this was a theory that, that really drew me in. Um, and, and so as in any, any interdisciplinary settings, one thing that you have to do to begin with is define the terms you're using. Um, and if I use any you're not familiar with, please stop me and ask questions. Um, but in particular, with something like resilience that has, what Steve said this morning, 52 meetings, many meetings, I want you to understand how I'm using it. It isn't necessarily the right way to use it, but, but what you'll see in the way I use it um, with each of the definitions that I give you is that that um, I am extracting from the definitions that ecologists and others have put forward what I need to understand in order to think about what does this mean for the law. And so what, what resilience de describes is, is the ability of systems to respond to change and the ability or the lack of ability to respond but to change into an alternative regime. And, and my favorite examples are these two shown on here. So I'm going to start with the one um, that shows the, the pool riffle sequence. And it's a really good example of nonlinearity in, in geographic space. Um, and I think why I like that one, I actually was in graduate school in geology at the University of Washington when Mount St. Helens blew. And one of the things I, I got to do was be a field assistant for someone who was working on studying the redevelopment of a stream channel after it had been devastated by the explosion in the ash flows that, that followed from that. Um, and, and what I learned is, you know, basically a, a river from headwaters to sea is simply dissipating energy. But miraculously, it does not do that just in a straight trend. It does so in this series of pools and drops, pools and drops, pool and riffle sequences. And it actually turns out that for a given system, you can mathematically predict the spacing of them. That is amazing. That is a nonlinear system. Um, and, and the system below actually is, is a lake that the, the Caption said it was in Canada. I've now learned that it's probably one of Steve's experimental systems. <laughs> so it has a barrier in the middle, and nutrients have been added to, added to the side that, that turned green um, until eutrophication occurs. And so that's a good example of nonlinear systems in time. There's sort of a threshold. You keep adding the nutrients, and you have the, the relatively clear water um, until a point at which it cannot keep adapting within, within the bowl. And it flips and goes to eutrophication. And, and one thing about that that's represented by the two, two bowls with the threshold in between is the fact that now it's going to be harder to go back to where you were previously. And that's one of the reasons we want to manage um, to stay on one side of the threshold if we're in a system we like. The other thing about the definition of resilience that's illustrated by the bowl is the width of the bowl kind of reflects the ability of a system to adapt to change. The lat it's called the latitude. Um, and still maintain the same structure and function. And so that's, that's the definition you see most commonly coming out of articles on ecological resilience. But the depth of the bowl, the other thing we, we talk about is the ability of the system to resist change. And the resistance is much more common and, and how quickly it will bounce back from a disturbance. Um, 
the, that is the property we talk about more in engineering, and it's increasingly used as a term in the disaster response literature. Um, in law, both are relevant. You just have to know which one you're, you're using. Laws help us with responding to disaster, but they also help us in navigating change by much slower variables. Um, so. So thinking about that, and after I'd educated myself on, on as, as much as I could on ecological resilience, um, you, you could say, well, if, if ecological systems are nonlinear and have periods of change and of stasis, maybe social systems are too. Well, that's the type of question we would leave to the social scientists. The, the legal scholars aren't asking those type of questions. Instead, what, what we ask is, well, if this is true, maybe our laws can be designed to mediate this interaction, mediate the interaction between society and the ecosystem, which is, is shown by, by this in terms of governance. This is about as complex as we get in the legal field with our little conceptual diagrams. We use a whole lot of text to communicate things. Um, so, so a project that I've been working on now for the last three years is really thinking about if, if governance is a bridging concept between society and ecological mm -hmm. systems, can we tease out the role of law and begin to understand social ecological interactions in periods of change and how law can be designed both to help us adapt and to be adaptive itself. In, in short, that can boil down to how can we design law to facilitate adaptive environmental governance. Um, and that brings me to governance that you've already heard a definition of, so I can be fairly quick here, but this is an example of how I'm tailoring the definition for, for what I need to get out of it or what I need to explain to people when I'm talking about governance. And that is that governance is, is a bigger category than government. Government is just a subset of governance. Um, as, as Oren talked about, the governance is, is sort of the steering of society that's done both by private actors, NGOs, um, through our social norms, but government plays a role in it. Um, and mostly today I'm going to be talking about the role of law in how it places bounds on how government acts, how it structures government, how it gives authority to government to take particular actions. Um, and so then in, in that context, adaptive governance that I'll also be talking about is governance that's capable of self-organizing through formal and informal networks at the scale and in response to change. And so this goes very much to what Oren was talking about, about fit. You couldn't possibly write laws that establish units of government that are going to respond to the scale and the type of every potential change that's coming with climate change. You, you, you couldn't predict it, also it would be too costly. The bu bureaucracy would be huge. Instead, you have to step back and think about how can we make it so government can be more nimble. It has to have the ability to learn and it has to also have the capacity to evolve. Well, far greater minds than, than mine are, are thinking about these types of things. Um, for, for me, in order to understand it and, and also to be able to explain it to a group, it works best if I, if I do it in the context of a system that I know deeply um, and am very passionate about so I can illustrate some of these concepts. And for me, that's the Columbia River Basin. Um, what I'm going to do, so, so the process that, that the group I work with has, has gone through in looking at our, our large North American water basins is um, to look at a particular system like the Columbia historically and say what transformations has it gone through in the past and then tease out what was the role of law in those transformations. So that's one way to understand law within the complexity that it exists. You know, as we, someone said earlier, you can't really experiment with social systems, but you can look at how they've responded historically with a firm understanding, as, as Karen has told us, that, that we're in a period of much more rapid change and there are different aspects to it. And that's where then turn to theory 
related to adaptive governance to say um, how does that inform additional aspects that we need to be thinking about in, in designing governance. Well, over history, the Columbia River Basin has gone through three major transformations. And, and I've learned that, that you can tell this story of transformation from many different perspectives. For me, the one that is most compelling is to talk about the history of indigenous peoples in the basin. Um, that may be because that's when I first went into law, I spent 10 years negotiating Native American water rights, so I'm most deeply familiar with. Um, but, but it's also one of the more interesting stories, particularly when you look at what's happening today within the basin. Um, and so prior to European contact, we have sort of what, what Oren described earlier is, is Native American communities were highly adapted to salmon runs, um, the various salmon runs within the basin. Um, and I'm told by ecologists that this is true of ecological systems. It apparently is also true of social systems. When you have um, a system that's very highly adapted to a social system, to the ecological system that it relies on, it is also highly vulnerable to outside disturbance. And that, of course, came in the form of European contact. Um, European contact brought war, disease, and law. Law in the forms of treaties. Um, Negotiation with tribes occurred through multiple interpreters. When you look at the descriptions of, of treaty negotiations within the Columbia River Basin, they say that, that for some of the bands, translation had to go through 13 translators. And it was done in Chinook jargon, which is described as travel jargon. We all know what that is, right? Donde esta la baña? You know, dos cerveza, por favor, imagine negotiating your homeland with that level of comprehension about what is going on. Um, that legacy has played a huge, has, has a huge impact on the basin today. The treaties that were negotiated, and why I have this slide up, this shows four of the 15 reservations on the US side of the basin, and within almost a single generation, their territory went from the lighter colors to the darker colors. Um, and playing out through the entire reservation, these little brown outlined areas are the territory today of the 15 reservations within the US side of the basin. And then there are 11 First Nations in Canada that claim land or water within the basin who, who have not yet settled what their rights are. OK, the next transformation that occurred was referred to um, in the question and answer section last time, the New Deal, or what we call in the Columbia the dam building era. Um, because of and in response to the Great Depression, we had intervention from outside the basin, from the federal government um, infusing the basin with, with money and projects to build dams and really engineer the system. Tribal communities both protested the building of the dams because these would destroy former fishing grounds, but also as casualties of the Great Depression, as, as with many the other people in the basin, they also joined work crews um, in, in order to have an, an income from building of the dams. Um, Along with the New Deal, the United States and Canada negotiated a treaty, and that resulted in dams being built in Canada and international cooperation on regulation of the basin. What we ended up with is a highly regulated, you can see the, the profile on the side and the little clover leaves show you the, uh, the dams that are in Canada, um, that is operated mainly for two purposes, hydropower and flood control. And any drop of water that's released from one of those dams in Canada produces hydropower over and over and over again as it goes down. So a incredibly, um, an incredibly economically important resource to the Pacific Northwest. It did more than help the region recover from the Great Depression. It built an entire economy at the same time contributed to the decimation of the salmon runs. Um, the pink areas on, on this particular map show areas that 
formerly had salmon spawning habitat and now are, are blocked by a dam to salmon spawning, 37% of the basin. Um, and down in the lower, your lower right, is the change in the hydrograph, a dampening of the hydrograph because of damming and operation of the river. And then up in the, in the upper right, you see the listing of species, the, the result of that operation. So 13 anadromous species, salmon and steelhead, and two resident species within the basin. Um, so major economic boon in that, in that period, but also a huge loss. Um, the next period is the one we're still in now, and we're still waiting to see how much it will actually change the ecological system. The social system is already undergoing um, what I think is quite a transformation within the basin. And it really began with, um, the, on, on the heels of the movement I talked about earlier, the civil rights movement. Does anyone know um, of, a, of a parallel movement to that called AIM? What does that? Anybody know what that means? American Indian Movement. Yeah, the American Indian Movement. This corresponded to the increase in legal representation in Indian country throughout the U.S. and then the effort to exercise treaty rights, often through acts of civil disobedience, in order to test those rights in court. A major case in the Columbia River Basin went to the U.S. District Court testing this treaty language that had been negotiated with Chinook language, jargon language, it was one of the most important things, oral history indicates, to, um, to the tribes in the negotiations, and that is that they would be able to maintain the right of taking fish at all usual and accustomed places in common with the citizens of the territory. This means off-reservation fishing rights. Testing these rights and testing whether the state of Washington could actually regulate their access to them um, the federal district court held that this language entitled the tribes who had that language in their, in their treaties to one half of the harvestable fish that passed the, the usual and accustomed places. That was, in 1974, an earthquake within the Columbia River Basin. The most interesting story, though, is in its wake, the four tribes, the four reservations that had that language formed an agency, the Columbia River Intertribal Fish Commission, initially with the idea of, well, okay, we get half the harvest, but we have to divvy it up among ourselves. Um, through federal funding grants and mitigation money from the hydropower system, this has become one of the, if not the, most sophisticated and powerful fisheries science and policy agencies in the Pacific Northwest. You will not have a discussion of fisheries in the Columbia River Basin without them at the table. So that capacity building after establishing a right is a huge change. Well, how much of a change is this? In 1948 to 1964 was the period of negotiation of the Columbia River Treaty, and in that time, no tribes or First Nations were consulted in the process. Today, that treaty is under review, and in 2010, the 15 tribes within the basin came together despite previous animosity and disputes over fishing grounds and in a very sophisticated act of diplomacy issued a statement on their common views on the future of the Columbia River and they have stuck with that ever since. When the United States began the review process on the U.S. side of the border, they had a sovereign review team which had representation from the 15 tribes within the basin and the states. In their Common Views document, the tribes had said, we benefit as well from hydropower and flood control. We do not want that to go away. We would like some of the revenue from it. But we want ecosystem function elevated to a third prong of the treaty. In December of 2014, the recommendation went from the region to the Department of State asking for three prongs to a new treaty, hydropower, flood control, and ecosystem function. It's an amazing, amazing depth of change within the basin. Now, will that end up in a new Columbia River Treaty? Um, it's, it's really hard, hard to tell at this point if that will occur, but will it ultimately end up in changes to how the river is operated? 
how we do flood control. There, there are already are a series of, of lawsuits that are moving things forward in terms of using non-structural <laughs> rather than structural methods on flood control. So I think those changes will play out. Okay, so in telling this story about the Columbia River, what I'm trying to do is give you a feel for the interaction between society, law, and the river. What we did after that, and we did this with this, the same process with, with six basins in North America, is then try to tease out of that what was the role of law. How did it hinder adaptation in these cases? In some cases, how did it trigger it? often with, with a lot of the litigation brought to, to enforce rights. Um, and how did it facilitate adaptation in these cases? And then the second step in that was to take what we're learning from people who, who work on the theoretical aspects of ecological resilience and adaptive governments and say, um, using that, then what more would we need to do? Um, and we've come up with, with sort of a method of inquiry that has three categories to it. Uh, the first, call the, the structural category, those laws that deal with the structure of government, meaning how is authority distributed among different levels of government, what resources do they have, and how do they connect to each other, either uh, what authority do they have to do that, either mandated, so formal, um, or, or just allowed to, informal ability to connect. Second, what capacity do they have? And in this, the law plays a role in things like providing the legal tool to actually implement things like adaptive management or adaptive planning is, is the word we use, but scenario planning would be one subset within that. Um, so the authority to do that. And that's usually when you read the, the scientific literature on adaptive governance, that's the main category of capacity they look at. Because of our own experience, we added a second category to capacity, and that is the capacity to participate in governmental action. And that goes way beyond simply the legal authority um, to, to take public comment and, and sort of check that off the list, hold the public meeting, check it off. Um, what we put into the category of participatory, participatory capacity is how are resources distributed? What is the ability, thinking of the, the governance capacity that was built with the Columbia River Intertribal Fish Commission, what is the capacity of local entities to be able to actually participate in decisions having to do with the resources they rely on, what's the ability to, of the government to use local knowledge, um, how much decision-making authority is included at the local level. And, and then finally, process. And again, when you look at the, um, the theoretical literature, um, what you mainly see is this idea of, of allowing public participation. But we knew, those of us who study the law, um, knew that discrimination and disparate treatment is inherently destabilizing. Um, that if you don't design process so that it's inclusive, it's transparent, it's accountable, it's perceived as legitimate, it is legitimate, you ultimately will not have a system that, that is socially sustainable. And so the category of process aims at getting those. We then have taken this process of inquiry, or in May when we come back to Sisink, we'll be taking this process of inquiry and applying it back to the basins that we studied and, and sort of going through how robust it is, how do we want to change it. One of the things that we know we've learned in doing this goes back to the idea that there are no panaceas. What we're developing is a process of inquiry that you would need to apply to the system that you're looking at. And, and one of the reasons for that, what we realized as we were doing this historical review, is that, that we never write on a clean slate. There are legacy effects that are going to influence both in studying them, help you identify where the sticking points are um, to adaptation in this particular basin, but are also going to influence the, the solutions that you choose. 
So for example, in the Columbia River Basin, the dams are a legacy effect. They're there, but not only are they there, they are heavily relied on by the Pacific Northwest for its economy, and they are a source of non-carbon energy. So in the short term, those dams are not going to go away. At the same time, they've had a huge effect on the salmon population that the people in the basin want to recover. And then the, the other legacy effect that we've really paid attention to in the Columbia is simply the legacy effect of marginalization of Native American peoples. Um, in many ways, that effect has led to change that's moving in a very positive direction now, but it also has to be addressed in that process. Um, so, so really, in thinking about this, this is, this is hard place-based work. It's not something, um, at least at this point, that I think legal scholars can say, here's the solution, just pass this law, and all will, all will be good. But I think if I said that, you would probably all laugh me out of the room, since you have enough of a, a sophisticated understanding to know. Um, so that's, that's basically where we're at. Um, what, I'm gonna, what I'd like to do, I think it's fitting to close with the words of someone who, who really understood this flexibility very well. Billy Frank Jr. Um, was a Nisqually activist um, with the Nisqually tribe who was a, a leader in the actions that led to the decision that recognized the fishing rights of the tribes in the Pacific Northwest. Um, in the remembrances when he passed in 2014, he was described as a, someone who was passionately and constantly committed to environmental justice. And one thing that he said um, that I think really captures our complex relation to nature is, I don't believe in magic. I believe in the sun and the stars, the water, the tides, the flood, the owls, the hawks flying, the river running, the wind talking, their measurements. They tell us how healthy they, things are. They tell us how healthy we are because we and they are the same. Mm -hmm.